HistoryRadio.org now takes you to the early 19th century, where Missy McNatt, a reporter for the National Archives in Washington, D.C., is about to interview America's first literary celebrity, Washington Irving, author of The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. The audio was released under a Creative Commons license. Hello from the National Archives Public Programs and Education Team. My name is Missy McNatt and welcome. Today we meet Washington Irving. Washington Irving is considered by many to be the father of American literature. But Washington Irving, with his sketchbook of Jeffrey Crayon, including the short stories, Rip Van Winkle, have pure American themes, American settings, and American characters. But Washington Irving also wrote essays, histories, and biographies. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce to you Washington Irving. Well, good day, and thank you so much for that lovely and kind introduction. Yes, my name is Washington Irving. And I am an author. I really like to think about myself more as a storyteller. I love a good story. And I, so many people I spend time with do too. So um, a little bit about me. Uh, it was mentioned before that I wrote a couple of well-known stories. You may have heard of The Legend of Sleepy Hollow and Rip Van Winkle, but I have written many, many other things in my life, I'm happy to say. And I've also had a couple of other professions, but they really didn't bring me the, the reward I was looking for the way writing did. So I was born in New York City, Manhattan, 1783, the youngest of 11 children. Now, unfortunately, two of my siblings passed away in infancy, but we had a very happy family as we grew up. So what does Washington Irving have to say? My father, William, ran a very successful hardware business. My mother, Sarah, was a wonderful and loving parent who really taught her children to read, which you might take for granted nowadays. When I was a child, not many people had the opportunity to learn to read because my father's hardware business was successful. So I'm just going to uh, stop for a second. And my mother was someone who was an avid reader and insisted, really wanted her children to read. I learned to read and write at a young age. I remember reading Sinbad the Sailor, Robinson Crusoe, a book called The World Displayed about travel. And I did travel a great deal in my life. Always loved to travel. In fact, when I was young, I... Yeah, that's interesting. I had a frail constitution. And it was thought at that time, if a child has poor health, they need to go outside. They need to breathe in fresh air. So I was sent out quite a bit. Actually, as a young boy, I was sent up. I had a trip up north of Manhattan along the Hudson River, not far from where North Terrytown was located, where the Sleepy Hollow area is. I also grew to fall in love with the Catskill Mountains of New York. And many, many of my writings are really informed by the sights, the smells, the sounds that I knew as a young man. So uh, I actually started writing as quite a young man. In fact, I wrote a series of columns when I was a teenager for one of my brothers, Peter. He was the editor of Manhattan newspaper. We wrote about social affairs and I wrote under the name Jonathan Old Style. Yes, I loved writing under unusual names. It's always great fun for me. But my family thought that writing would not be an avid profession for me as a child. They thought that law would be a good thing for me to do. Well, I'm not sure I completely agreed, but I did, in fact, study law. I passed the New York State Bar exam in 1806, just barely. I began to work as an attorney myself. I worked with a couple of different attorneys. I ended up with a man named Judge Josiah Hoffman. The greatest thing about that was his daughter, Matilda. Matilda Hoffman and I fell in love. We became engaged to be married. Unfortunately, Matilda passed away at age 17 
which would happen to children at that time, I must say. And I must tell you, you might think I had a sad life. I didn't. Even though Matilda was the great love of my life, I enjoyed a very, very happy life. I did not marry, did not have children, but I did have the joy of many dear friends and many family members too. Yeah. So I wrote a number of things during that time. I actually wrote a small group of stories with one of my brothers. But one of the things that I felt really needed to bring me to attention was something that would capture my listeners. So we grew up in Manhattan. The founders of Manhattan were Dutch. Some of these founders, my family was not too keen on. So in 1809, I wrote a book called A History of New York, written under the pen name Dietrich Knickerbocker. Isn't that a great name? Yeah. Dietrich Knickerbocker. It was my fun name that I could sort of poke fun at some of those Dutch people who were running Manhattan at the time. In fact, the story was quite well received. Many of the people, the characters in that story, were actually thinly veiled versions of people that I knew personally. And some of them were not too happy to find themselves in print and be made fun of. But the book was quite successful. I became a head of a group of authors at the time called the Knickerbocker Group. And the term Knickerbocker has been used for quite some time afterwards. But my financial success did not happen. I wanted to earn a bit more money as an author, but at that time I could not. So I actually joined the family hardware business. In 1811, excuse me, I moved to Washington. I became a lobbyist with a couple of my brothers. It was all right. I ended up going in 1815 to Liverpool. I became a representative of the family hardware business in, in England, but I didn't enjoy it. What I really enjoy is writing. I really don't like working. So I'm just going (laughs) to... I know that's a funny thing for me to say. I would much rather just tell stories. And luckily, I found that people seem to enjoy my stories. Uh, In England, and then I started to travel throughout Europe. I went to Austria. I went to Germany. I wrote stories as I went. And I thought to myself, actually the encouragement of a friend of mine, put them together and maybe let's see if we can publish them. 1819 and 1820, the sketchbook of Jeffrey Crayon, gentlemen, was published. My works were put out for the general public and people loved them. This was the collection of short stories that contained The Legend of Sleepy Hollow and Rip Van Winkle, among many others. And my success was guaranteed. Well, almost. I found that after that time, people started to take me seriously as an author. And I actually began to earn my living from my pen, which was great. Anyway, go back to question. What does Washington Irving have to say? So, as I say, I traveled throughout Europe. I wrote a sequel to the sketchbook called Brace Bridge Hall, which was somewhat successful. I wrote another sequence of books called uh, The Tales of a Traveler. And I ended up finally, after all of my travels, ending up in Madrid, Spain. 1826, I've been away for quite some time, I was invited to join the American legation, sort of like a delegation in Spain at that time, which I did. I spent quite some time, Spain is beautiful. I lived primarily in Madrid while I was there, and I wrote two books about Christopher Columbus, who I'm sure you've heard of. I wrote a book called Alhambra, based on Moorish legends of the time, and they were wonderful. Uh, Well, I'm back, and uh, yeah, Um, so who? Well, I was growing tired of being away from home, as you might imagine, 17 years since I had last set foot in New York. I came home in 1832. Well, my, I received such a warm reception. People knew me. People knew me on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. People acclaimed me as a very accomplished author. It was quite wonderful. So you may know me by now. My two passions in life are writing and travel. I love to travel. Sir, you know, I had mentioned earlier that the... Before I settled down permanently in New York, I decided to travel through the southwestern part of this area of ours. The southwestern was part of this land was new. It was exciting. I wrote books as I went. In fact, a tour of the prairies was known for quite some time as the source of information about the people and places of that area. 
I returned back to my roots and Hudson River in the late 1830s. I bought a home, Sunnyside, New York. Beautiful, lovely home there. I settled down and I was planning on simply maybe moving into retirement, spending my life writing. Well, in the 1840s, the president contacted me, said, Mr. Irving, we'd like you to consider becoming the United States ambassador to Spain. Well, now, I had worked a little bit with the American legation in Spain. I had some experience, but I certainly never thought of myself as a political figure. But I thought a challenge is here. I like it. I decided to accept the president's offer. I became the ambassador to Spain for four years. Well, it was a wonderful time. Again, being back in Spain, living there, being able to help influence things of the time. I grew tired, however, of being away from home. I came back to uh, Sunnyside in the mid 1840s. I settled down, began to continue to write. And I must tell you, I'm proud of a number of things in my life. But one of the things that I was most proud of, I became the president of the Astor Public Library. If you've been to Manhattan, you may know it's on Fifth Avenue. There are two large lions out in front. I was actually the president of that library for a number of years. And I did write a five volume biography of George Washington. So a little question for you. My name is Washington Irving. I was born in New York City in 1783. Who do you think I was named after? Yes, of course, George Washington. So a story for you. My mother was in the, in the streets of New York. There was a parade celebrating the great man's life and his help of this country. My mother thought to herself, I'm so honored by what this man's done for the country. I'm going to name one of my children after him. And so she did. Her last child, I was named Washington Irving. And also my mother tells me that the general, the president, came over to her and actually gave me his blessings while I was in the carriage. Now, I'm not completely sure if that's true. Did my mother make that up? But I must say, I have really loved George Washington. And this volume, these series of volumes, the piece of literature for which I hope I will be remembered forever. Now, as you know, I grew up at a time when writing was new. It was new as a thought. People didn't think of this as something you could make a living at. I wanted to make my living being a writer. Well, at that time, there were no protections for authors at all. There would be uh, people who would steal and take your ideas. Now, I must admit, I have borrowed ideas from many, many different places. But I wanted to have a living where I could maybe earn money from my writing as people would buy it. And at that time, there was no protection for authors. So I worked tirelessly, tirelessly for what were known as copyright laws. One reason I spent time in England, is because actually in England, there was a protection there. They actually, their publishing firms offered guidance, assistance, stronger laws that helped protect us. And I'm very proud of the fact that we started to establish some of those laws here in the United States. That's interesting. I'm an education specialist in Washington, D.C. Now, what I'd really like to do this morning is to share with you one of my stories. I have many that I really enjoy. And I'd like to go back to the sketchbook, the sketchbook, which may have been uh, early in my career, one of my greatest successes. I was greatly influenced by the Catskill Mountains of New York. I love them. If you have an opportunity to ever go to New York, sit up along the Hudson, see the cat, oh, the hills, the valleys, even the smells of the land are wonderful. So at any rate, I should stop talking about myself and actually read one of my favorite stories, Rip Van Winkle, which came out in the sketchbook. Here it goes. Whoever has made a voyage up the Hudson must remember the Catskill Mountains. They are a dismembered branch of the great Appalachian family. They are seen away to the west of the river, swelling up to a noble height and lording it over the surrounding country. At the foot of these fairy mountains, the voyager may have de described the light smoke curling up from a village whose shingled roofs gleam among the trees just where the blue tints of the upland melt away into the fresh green of the nearer landscape. Now, in that same village, 
in one of these very houses, which to tell the precise truth was sadly time-worn and weather-beaten, there lived many years since, while the country was yet a province of Great Britain, a simple, good-natured fellow of the name of Rip Van Winkle. So I say a simple, good-natured man he was. Moreover, so who was your strongest influence as an author? You know, I had mentioned earlier that the earlier authors were influenced by the, the English classics. Mm -hmm. So uh, where did your, who was a particular author or someone? Well, I did read a great deal. It's a wonderful question. I read a great deal as a child. I've read many other authors. Uh, there were some wonderful authors, contemporaries of mine. Um, I would say that probably my greatest influence was a Scottish gentleman. You may have heard of him. He wrote a wonderful book called Ivanhoe. I was in England at the time, feeling quite down upon myself. My writing career had not been successful, was not taking off. The family business was not doing well. I didn't really like being working for the family hardware business. Sir Walter Scott spoke to me, said, Washington you need to keep writing. You need to keep doing your job, put things together. It was actually his influence that allowed me to gather a number of stories I'd written while in Europe and put them together in the sketchbook. And we do have folks from Scotland, from Edinburgh, and I, I think it might be my, my grandchildren. So I'm just going to say a special hello to Ashlyn Stewart and Betsy Clare. If so, well, we have loved having you with us today. And uh, I love the story. What, you know, Rip Van Winkle is. You have just heard, a dramatized interview with Washington Irving. This is an edited version of an episode released under a Creative Commons license, by the National Archives Young Learners Program. Washington Irving was played by the actor, Neil Hartley. The interviewer was Missy McNatt. This is HistoryRadio.org, a free radio stream, promoting knowledge of literature and history.